असतो मसगमया तमसो मोतिर्गमया मृत्योर्मा अमृतंगमया लॉर्ड लीडर्स फ्रॉम द अनरियल टू द रियल फ्रॉम इग्नोरेंस टू इल्यूमिनेशन फ्रॉम डेथ टू इमोटैलिटी ओम फेस 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 पी एंड टू आर If you have noted down, there are some what is called dhyana shloka. Shloka is on meditation on Bhagavad Gita. I will discuss about it slightly later on today's class. I have selected four because they are very easy to chant. So if you still remember, please join me. प्रपन्न पारिजातायत्रेत्रकपाणे ज्ञान मुद्रा कृष्णा गीतामृतुहे नम सर्वोपनिषदो गावो दोग्धा गोपालनंदन पार्थो वत्स सुधीर्भोक्ता दुग्ध गीतामृत महत् वसुदे वसुत देव कंसचाणूरमर्दनम देवकी परमानंद कृष्ण वंदे जगद्गु मूक कौति वाचाल पंगु लंघयते गिरी यमह वंदे परमानंदमाधव टुडे क्लास फस्ट वी विल डिस्कस वाट आर दि स्पेशल फीचर्स ऑफ भगवदगीता सेकेंड there are nine dhyana shlokas dhyana means meditation why is meditation so very important uh, we will discuss about it then third in outline of the first chapter of which i have already sent you notes and those who want these notes please contact mr janak he is here and he will send you the notes it will be very useful even if you do not go through the whole class but if you just go through the notes these notes are like sutras sutra means a thread so that will remind us what we had discussed previously and also prepare us for what is going to come next so first what are the important points special points every scripture has got some very special message though all scriptures ultimately in essence teach the same truth but every scripture has got some emphasis on certain special points and bhagavad gita and the teachings of sri ramakrishna and swami vivekananda they come very close together in fact i have told many times that if you have not read the vedas which are our foundational scriptures but if you have read gita it is as good as equivalent to the study of the vedas and if you have not read gita but if you have read the gospel of sri ram krishna it is as good as reading understanding studying bhagavad gita so those who have read the important teachings of sri ram krishna by the gospel means again i can summarize i have summarized the gospel as five commandments of sri ram krishna and if you have understood the five commandments of sri ram krishna you have understood the entire gospel if you have understood the entire gospel then you have understood the gita and if you have understood the gita you understood the entire 
Vedas. And even if you have doubts whether I understood or not, you need to understand only one sentence from the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. What is that sentence? What is the essence of Gita? The essence of Gita is what you get by repeating that word again and again, then it becomes Thagi. Thagi means give up. Give up what? Give up unreality. Give up the wrong CV we are cherishing now and get the right CV. So if we remember that, we have remembered the whole thing. Sri Ramakrishna is a past master in summarizing things. On the very first day M met Sri Ramakrishna, he has summarized the entire Vedas. If you remember, just to remind you, what is that? What is the essence of Sandhya? Sandhya means the upper caste people do at dawn and dusk. That is called Sandhya. Sandhya means the junction between day and night. So what do these people do? They have a special kind of upasana or meditation which is called Sandhya. This Sandhya means actually that junction between day and night. But because at that time these people do elaborate rituals, that is why it goes by the name of the dawn dusk worship. Uh, if you cannot do that, he condensed it. What is it? Gayatri. If you cannot do even the Gayatri, he said it is condensed into one syllable. Om. Om ityeka aksharam brahma vyaharan maam anasmaran. Bhagavad Gita tells us, if a yogi remembers this one akshara, it's very interesting, akshara. It is called akshara. Om iti eka aksharam. Eka means one. Om. Then he he attains to the supreme reality. So coming back, we will discuss very briefly. Why briefly? Because during our further talks, these things will be discussed elaborately as and when the topic comes. But I am highlighting what are the special points of Bhagavad Gita, which it specializes crystal clearly about it. The first thing, I already mentioned, what is Hinduism? Hinduism is nothing but the explanation of four Purusharthas. What are they? Dharma, Artha, Kama and Moksha. And it is curious to know that it is not only Hinduism. This is the essence of every religion. What does it say? Man is after happiness. Most of the people are after limited happiness. A few people want infinite happiness. So all people can be divided into two categories. Those who want small happiness or those who want Big, not bigger, infinite, infinite happiness. happiness. Now, even that statement, everybody wants only limited happiness, is a wrong statement in reality. Even worldly people, they want infinite happiness. But what it should be translated as, those who use limited instruments mm -hmm. get limited happiness, and those who use no instrument get infinite happiness. But the way to the infinite happiness is from the limited instruments to the beyond the any instrument. So first to use the body, then use the mind, then go beyond both body and mind. That should be the thing. So every religion, it only teaches us these two facts, Purusharthas how man can attain either temporary limited happiness or he can also get infinite happiness. Now, let us not 
have a mistake that people want temporary happiness. No, they do not want temporary happiness. But they would not use the proper instruments to get infinite happiness. Why? Because of the power of Maya. Maya makes them use limited instruments and very, very feeble way of using it. And that's why the result also will be according to what instrument we use. I gave the example, God is like an ocean. So if you go to the ocean, two points you note, you don't need to beg the, an ocean that you give me some water. It is. It doesn't even know that you want water. You take as much as you want. But how much can you bring back? Depends upon what instrument you take, what utensil you take to bring it. This is a very apt illustration because otherwise we think God has to be pleased. He has to be begged. Then he will say, let me think about it. And then if I feel like giving to you, I will give. Then I, how much I feel like giving to you, I will give. That is a wrong. It's just like an ocean. Open. You go and take what you want. Like light. Surya Bhagavan never says, you take only this much light. It depends upon us. So every religion is nothing but an exposition of these four values of human life. Human life because it is called Purusha Artha. Purusha Artha. Purusha means not man. The Indians can mistake, you know, Purusha. This teaching is meant only for men. No, they are not Purusha. Purusha means human being. Every human being can and must want or strive after, there is no choice here, of four supreme values. These values are subdivided into two. One is the instrumental value and another is the intrinsic value, final value. Dharma, Artha and Kama are instrumental values and Moksha is the intrinsic. ultimate. Intrinsic means Instrumental means that which is meant for something else. Intrinsic means it is a value in itself, by itself, not for anything else. So everything else is meant for happiness. Why do you want to, to attend Gita class? I want knowledge. Why do you want knowledge? I want to get rid of, tackle with problems. Why do you want to tackle with problems? I want to be happy. And why do you want to be happy? There is no answer. I, I want to be happy because that's my nature. That's what I want. It doesn't lead to something else. Purushartha. So this is the first point. Bhagavad Gita crystal clearly expounds the nature of the four Purusharthas and clearly points out that the very first value we have to seek is dharma. And that is why the Bhagavad Gita starts with what? Dharma. 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 dharma kshetre, Kurukshetre. And then it also ends with dharma. Sarva dharman parityajya. So we will discuss these points in elaboration. That is the first thing. Second, in the Hindu scriptures, especially Hindu scriptures, and in no other scriptures you will get such an idea about incarnation of God. In the Hindu scriptures, there are several, uh, what is called, unclear and indirect references to the fact of God incarnating as a incarnation, coming down as a human being. For example, in Bhagavatam, we get 10 incarnations, 24 incarnations and many, many incarnations. In Ramayana, Rama himself was supposed to be an incarnation of Bhagavan Vishnu. So, why does, what is an incarnation of God? When does he incarnate? 
and how does he incarnate and what does he do? I think in our last class we have clearly discussed these points. This has been so clearly, categorically taught in the Bhagavad Gita. So just to remind ourselves, when does God incarnate or how many times does he incarnate? How many times? Infinite number of times. When there is a need, God comes. Yada yadahi dharmasya glanihi. So here also a small point to be noted down. What does the, the uh, uh, when dharma goes down? What does it mean? It means when man becomes profoundly confused, unhappy. When man becomes very very unhappy and doesn't find a solution. Let me elaborate. A little bit here. There are small unhappiness, you know, a mosquito bites. You don't pray to God. <laughs> yeah. Are are <laughs> so the point here is there are so many types of miseries, unhappinesses for which we have means. Though temporary, we have means. And we know when we know we have means then we don't pray to God, you have to come down. But a time comes, and that is what the first chapter of the Bhagavad Gita is going to tell us, that when such a profound grief overtakes, possesses a person, he says, I, have, I don't see any way out. No scripture can help. No guru can help. Nothing in this world can help. There is only one remedy and that is God himself has to come and help me. But God doesn't come down for the sake of one person. When the whole humanity, whole world, this is an important point, God doesn't incarnate for a particular region particular country, particular religion, particular segment of humanity. It comes for the welfare of the entire world. Why? Because the entire world is nothing but creation of God. In his eyes, there, is, uh, there are no foreign countries. In his eyes, there is no foreign country. But we all have foreign countries, you know. Do you know what is foreign country? In case you don't know, every other person is a foreign country. <laughs> Philosophically, psychologically, we just don't have any entry into that other country. No visa allowed. If visa allowed also, I will share my thoughts with you, means what? I will give you temporary visa. <laughs> That's it. For God, the whole universe is like a mother looking after the, after her children. So he comes. This is what. When a large segment of humanity is undergoing profound misery, grief, suffering, and when there is nobody who can point out a way, God incarnates as a human being. And what does he do? Dharma sthapana. How does he do it? So what is the cause of grief? Any type of grief has a cause. Grief is an effect. Therefore it must have a cause. What is the cause? Ignorance in some respect or the other. Ignorance. Agnana. What is Agnana? Not knowing what is the problem. Not knowing what is the solution. What did I say? Not knowing what is the problem. We do not even know what is the problem. There is a beautiful parable which illustrates this. Uh, this um, what, what is it called? Sufism has created, one, there was one author called Idris Shah. He created a character called Mullah Nasruddin. The exploits of Mullah Nasruddin. 
So what happened? One day he lost a ring in a pool and he saw there were lots of people, hundreds of people taking bath in that pool. There was another pool nearby. Nobody was going there. So he went into that pool and started searching. <laughs> After some time, someone saw him and said, Mullah, what are you searching? And he said, I lost my ring, so I'm searching for it. So the other person joined, some other person joined, hundred persons joined, and they were all searching. Hundred, one person, one person came, and he asked, Mullah, what are you all doing? So I'm searching for it. Where did you lose it? He said, I lost it in the other pool. <laughs> he said, if you have lost in the other pool, why are you searching here? Then he said, that you see there were, there were so many people, it is crowded, it is difficult to search, so the here it is clear, so I am searching here. So if we do not even know what we are suffering from. Only the first thing, is if we are diagnosed, this is your problem. What am I talking about? This is in the first chapter of the Gita. How did Gita start? Arjuna was going through profound misery. But he had a ready-made diagnosis. These are the reasons why I am suffering and this is the remedy also. Then Krishna looked at him. He did not speak a single word, just kept mum because he didn't seek his advice, unwarranted advice. Krishna will not give unwarranted advice. We are all experts, you know. We are all eager to give unwarranted advice. Even people don't have problems also. <laughs> so, what did, what did Arjuna do? He was going through a profound shoka, dukkha, vishada. That's why it is called vishada. Then you see, he thought, he knew. He knew the problem, he knew the solution. He did not know the problem, naturally he would not know the solution also. Later on, by the grace of Krishna, he understood, I am confused. And so, he understood, I am confused, I don't know what is the problem. Confusion means what? I don't know the problem, and much less the solution. The only way for me is to take the help of somebody who knows both the problem as well as a solution. And that somebody should be, first of all, an objective type of person. Secondly, he should be a person who doesn't have any vested interests. Thirdly, the person must be a wise person who knows what he is talking about. Three, these three conditions must be there. And Krishna fulfills all the three conditions. And so he took refuge. Refuge means what? He is telling by that, that I know that I do not know. I know that you know what is the solution to my problems. And I take refuge in you. That means what? I have 100% faith and I am going to take whatever you advise me, I am, I am going to follow it up, and then only Krishna opens his mouth and gives one shloka. What is that shloka? Bhagavad Gita starts, 11th shloka of the second chapter, until the 10th verse of the second chapter, it is all a background story. Ashochyan Anvashochastvam Pragna Vadamscha Bhashase Gatasum Agatasumscha Nanushochanti Pandita. He says, You are grieving like a wise person. You are talking like a wise person, grieving like a fool. These are opposite characteristics. Who is a wise person? Who never? Grieves. And who is a fool? Whatever he may talk. He doesn't have any knowledge. You are a fool pretending to be a wise man. 
because what is the correct definition of a wise man a wise man is a very happy person a wise man is a very happy person that is the definition we are not talking about worldly happiness <coughs> we are talking about happiness that arises out of knowledge gnanam that is where the bhagavad gita starts and it also ends ma shuchaha sarva dharman parityajya mamekam sharanam raja aham tva sarva papebhyo moksha ishyami ma shuchaha do not grieve because i will release you from all misery every misery and miseries belong only to two objects all miseries spring from two sources what are they body and mind identification with the body identification with all problems arising from body and mind what is the lesson if there is a body there will be problems if there is a mind there will be also how do we know we know because it is our personal experience every single day when we are in deep sleep what is that state when there is no body no mind not that there is no body mind there is no identity with body and mind that's why we are blissful and there is nobody there may be 1000 people around us but there would be there is nobody in that we are alone advaita dvaita means duality means unhappiness where there are two there is problem anyway there was a great soul called vidyaranya and he said once he made a very beautiful remark he said how spiritual aspirant should live said where there are two spiritual aspirants together it is called a village where there are three spiritual aspirants it is called a city <laughs> that means if there are two people there is every possibility that there is talk and then uh, misunderstanding and problems everything where there is a duality there is a problem where there is non duality there is no problem body mind means it is a duality that is why dvaita means not merely having body mind but having the identity that i am the body and mind let me dwell a moment upon this you see we are all so many people we are all sitting here together so i i am not identified with any of your bodies or minds that's why i don't suffer from your problems and you don't suffer from my problems none of us suffer from the problems of each other but supposing you are a family person you have husband or wife children something is not right would you not suffer sometimes we suffer more than even they suffer yeah maybe a patient when the patient is unconscious who suffers we are suffering so here also even though they are dif- separate from us as though we are, we have become them we identify ourselves with them so that illustrates an important point here a wise man can have body mind but as though he doesn't have any body and mind that's why he has no problems there is the, in fact there was a king whose name itself is bodilessness if you remember videha, videha. videha. janaka maharaja you know videha janaka this is a beautiful idea okay so first point we will expound these things in details when the topic comes so this is only just to highlight god incarnates and he teaches and gita is god's teaching and here what is it it is in 
wonderful exposition of Purushardha. He reminds us, you have to have dharma, you have to have artha, you have to have kama, you have all, but ultimately all these must be instruments which lead us to the highest Purushartha. What is it? Moksha means to know who, you, who we really are. Knowledge. Have knowledge. That is the essence of Mahavakya. A guru comes and tells, you know, you heard about Mahavakya? The whole Vedas contains Mahavakya. Aham Brahmasmi. It's called Mahavakya. The great sentence. Vakya means sentence. Maha means the supreme sentence. What does it tell you? Ar Tattvamasi. Thou art that. that. That means you are Brahman. You are God. You are divine. Each soul is potentially divine. That's what it is. So now we are coming to the second point. Divine incarnation. Why does he come? When a large number of humanity, his children, undergo profound grief and do not know what is the cause and do not know what is the solution, he incarnates. So what is the condition? Condition is a large number of humanity must be suffering intensely and do not know why and how to get rid of it. That is the essence of what is called Sarva, uh, what is called Yada Yadahi Dharma Siklan. That is the essence of it. He also comes to valid, validify, validate the truth of the scriptures. If somebody has to validate. And when we are discussing the life of great master, that is one of the points he made. Why is Ramakrishna had not got any education? Is it because he doesn't have intelligence? He was very, very intelligent, super intelligent. And yet, he had not cared for this kind of academic education. Why? What is the reason? Is there any special meaning in his not acquiring academic education? We already discussed. What was the point? To prove that uh, to, prove that it's not to be happy yeah. or to attain uh, to spiritual... Uh, no, no, no. You are right. But the right real point is, it is a historical necessity. What is the necessity? These days, there is a kind of knowledge called psychology has come. The psychologist will tell you, all the scriptures are bunk. <laughs> if anybody says, but I had a vision of God. Ah, when did you have a vision of God? Oh, after reading Bhagavatam, I meditated. Meditated means constantly I have been thinking. Naturally, whatever you believe, whatever you think, naturally you, will, you, you are self-proving what you already are thinking. This is a very peculiar point. I will just point it out. Some people are accident prone. Why are they accident prone? Accidents can happen without anybody's intention. That's a real accident. The other type of accident is the person goes on believing I am accident prone. <laughs> and he goes to prove that you see, I have been telling and you never believed me. See, it happened. <laughs> that is, there is a lot of truth in it. That means whatever we believe, happen to believe, so we think that is the truth. So if I go on thinking about uh, a particular form of God, then I am likely to have a vision of that particular form of God. So here psychology, these kind of psychologists come and tell us, that these are all fictions, imaginations of your brain. Just because you have been thinking, you are having these visions of God. So, that means all the scriptures are totally false. Somebody created a scripture and you have read it and then you started believing it and praying, thinking day and night. And then you had a vision, you say, yes, the scripture is true. Now, is the scripture true or because you believed the scripture true? <laughs> and you go on propagating it to your disciple and to his disciple like that. There is a tendency. Now, Sri Ramakrishna wanted to prove, put a stop to it and say, 
But I have not read any scriptures. I have not studied any scriptures. And yet I had all these truths abundantly, conclusively proved through, con uh, what is called prayer, only through prayer. As a very important point here is, Sri Ramakrishna's incarnation proves that through intense vyakulata he called yearning, if one prays to God, then he will realize the same truths by the grace of God. That's what he did in the first part of his sadhana. What is the second part? He actually followed all the scriptures, important scriptures, through proper authentic, authentic, uh, authentic gurus who have either realized God through their path or at least advanced very highly, like Bhairavi Brahmani, not a God-realized soul. Totapuri was a God-realized soul. So through them, a definite path he followed and then he proved once again, yes, they are all true. If you follow them, you will reach the same goal. So even then there are people who say the same old argument because you read and you had. But the point, counterpoint, how do we counter it? There is only one counter. You see, you psychologist, who comes to you, who comes for your advice? A person who is suffering from psychological problems. And they are very unhappy people. First of all, I am a very happy person. Secondly, I don't need your advice. Because people go to psychologists, what purpose? To become happy. But I am a very happy person. Then the psychologist will might counter, oh, you have got money, you have got a beautiful wife or husband or children or uh, friends, and because of all these things, no, I don't have any of these things. I am like that, like that king who doesn't have any clothes. Very happy person without any clothes. Person with clothes is very unhappy. A person without clothes is very, very happy. That's what Sri Ramakrishna wanted to prove. So, Sri Ramakrishna, or in the Bhagavad Gita, we are talking about Bhagavad Gita, that God incarnates, and also the, to prove the scriptures. And the scriptures tell us three things. Mainly, the scriptures teach us three things only. What are those three things? God exists, there is life after, and there are other worlds. This is what every scripture of every religion teaches. Vedas also teach the th these three things. They don't teach anything else about the sun, about the moon, etc. They don't teach. Why? We can get that knowledge through our five sense organs. So what is a Veda? A Veda is one which teaches us Thing, knowledge about things which we can never obtain, even after billion, billion years we can't obtain, through our five sense organs. So, Indriya Atita Jnanam is called Veda, one definition. Yeah. Agnata Gnapakam Shastra, another definition. That which you can never get through any other means or pramana. We will discuss about what is a pramana. Pramana means a means of acquiring knowledge is called a pramana. For example, I see the table. How do I see the table? I have knowledge of the table. How do I get this knowledge of the table? Because I have got eyes. And when you talk something, I hear. And when I talk something, I hope <laughs> you hear. So, to prove Everything that is written in the scriptures is absolute truth. That is one of the purposes of the avatar. Okay. The reincarnation. What follows? If there is afterlife, there is reincarnation. Where does this idea come in the Bhagavad Gita? It says when a person with whichever thought 
he gives up his body, then his next birth is determined by that. There are many shlokas are there. So those who perform a uh, lot of spiritual austerities and pujas, etc. So what, what, what do they do? They go to heavens. Evam trayi dharmam anuprapanna gata gatam kama kama lavante. So they go and then they come back. Once the credit card credit is over, then they will have to come down. Many times it is there. And in fact, according to Veda, the scripture is anadi. Anadi means what? No. Beginning. No. Yes. What does it mean? Scriptures or Vedas are not cre human creations. They are eternal. So we will discuss that point also. So Bhagavad Gita reinforces that belief that there are other worlds and death is not the end. So when we die, we it go to some other loka, up or down, happy world or unhappy world, swarga or naraka, but there is nothing called death. And that's a great relief. Yeah. Then, similarly, the law of karma. The law of karma. That is what is, what is karma? Whatever we do. So that uh, verse I have just now quoted, so whatever is the last to thought. So our next birth is determined by that thought. And what would be our last thought? Do not be under the any impression. I will not think of God whole life, but last moment I will, I will just think of God and I will give up the body and I will become God. It is not going to happen. Whatever uh, thoughts we cherish throughout life, that only comes. This is what Sri Ramakrishna put it in a most beautiful way. What does he say? He says, whatever, when a, when a person eats garlic, what is the belch that comes out? <laughs> garlic quality. So the last thought, if you are eating garlic whole life, <laughs> then you have to understand that the last thought will not be Krishna. It will be <laughs> garlic. How do we know? Next birth, others will know. <laughs> so, Mother, wherever is your center of consciousness? Huh? What, wherever is your center of consciousness, yeah. that will be your last thought. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yes. I will put it the other way, because consciousness is always associated with a thought. In fact, the moment you use the word thought, even if you say, I am thoughtless, <laughs> you, you have to be conscious. Yeah. 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 So, that consciousness has nothing to do with the thought. Our day-to-day -day habits have a lot to do with that. So, by the same token, this Bhagavad Gita also reinforces one idea from the Vedas, because it is the essence of the Vedas. What is that idea? The law of the chosen deity. Bhagavan Krishna, crystal clearly he says that whichever form devotees want to worship me with, I will respond to them in that particular form and I will reinforce their Shraddha in that particular form so that they will attain me through that form. So first they attain me in that form, later on they attain me through that form, my real nature. It's very clearly he has reinforced it. So, Hinduism consists of these four doctrines, if you remember. What are those four? God alone is real. Brahman alone is the only reality. And the second is the idea that we are living in the world of Maya and we have to get out of Maya. What is Moksha? Moksha means liberation. Revelation means freedom. What, what does freedom mean? Freedom from what? Maya. Freedom from ignorance. The another word for ignorance is Maya. Avidya, Agnana, Maya. These are the words. So first doctrine on which Hinduism stands is that there is only one reality that is called Brahman. Brahman. We use Vedic words. Aham Brahmasmi, etc. The second 
What is the second one? Just now I told. Moksha is the only goal of life. Ultimate goal of life is moksha. Moksha means freedom. Freedom from ignorance, bondage, maya. The third is the law of the Ishta Devata. That is, you can attain this freedom by worshipping God in a particular way. Whichever way you choose. Whichever way you choose. So God can assume any form a devotee likes to worship Him through. A devotee loves, I like this form of yours. And in Sri Ramakrishna's Gospel you get all these things so beautifully. It is, he says, God assumes various forms for the sake of His devotees. He says, and through that, from the form, he advances to the formless. From the formless, he advances to that which is beyond both form and formlessness. That is what Bhagavan Krishna, in the Gita, through the Gita, he conclusively, he proves it. Though some of his followers have become very fanatics. Accepting through Krishna, there is no salvation. Yeah, there are some people who say, Okay. In the Rig Veda, this idea of the law of chosen deity is beautifully put forward. Truth is one, but sages call it by various names. Ekam, Sat, Vipraha, Bahuda, Padanti. So Krishna had come to prove that. Sri Ram Krishna had come to prove that. In Bengali, that's what he said, Jyotomot, Tatopot. As many faiths, so many paths. Every faith is a path, but the goal is only one. All are travelling towards the same goal, only the paths differ. So in the Bhagavad Gita, harmony of all yogas and harmony of all philosophies. Again, we will discuss it when we are elaborated, when we are comes to the point. All the yogas, how many yogas are there? Four yogas are there. Karma Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, Jnana Yoga and Raja Yoga. And so many philosophies. How many philosophies are there? Three. Dvaita, Visistha Dvaita and Advaita. You take any religion in this world or every religion falls into one or more of these schools of philosophy and takes one or more of the yogas. So every religion is a combination of one particular philosophy and one particular or more yoga path. Yeah. So Bhagavad Gita says that you come, everybody comes to me only whatever path they follow. He never said this is Karma Yoga is better, Bhakti Yoga is better, Raja Yoga is better, or Gnana Yoga is better. Though there are some people who misuse and say Gnana Marga, the path of knowledge, is the only path ultimately everybody has to come. These are called fanatics. Sri Ramakrishna never said that, Swamiji never said that, Bhagavan Krishna never said that. In fact, what he says is, those who please me, I release them. Okay. Harmony of all yogas and philosophies. Both secular and spiritual knowledge is the same but two expressions of the same reality. So Bhagavad Gita speciality is not that only spiritual knowledge, secular knowledge, in knowledge there is no such division. It's an important point. Knowledge <coughs> has no such division. But how we use that knowledge depends upon whether it is secular or spiritual. Simple example. Here is a person who is expounding Gita. He has got knowledge about Gita. Is it spiritual or secular? Just now you are hearing from me. Knowledge by itself, per se, has no such division, secular or spiritual. What is the motive? If this person is teaching for the sake of money, for the sake of name and fame, for the sake of honor, etc., then that is called secular. But if he is doing this,
for the sake of pleasing the Lord. There is, I remember a beautiful incident. Once you know what happened, Holy Mother came to Belur Mat. And you know in Belur Mat, that kitchen, uh, many sadhus, brahmacharis sit and dress vegetables because they have to cook for five to six hundred people. So Holy Mother went and then she saw how wonderfully the how everybody was dressing the vegetables. Mm -hmm. Then she made a remark, Oh, these boys, they know how to dress. <laughs> then one of the Swamis, I think it may be Swami Jagadish Farananda, he remarked, It doesn't matter what we do, our goal is to please the Divine Mother. If we can please the Divine Mother by dressing the vegetables, all that we need is her, her blessings. Then we cross over the samsara. So the thing is, any knowledge, so a, a, a person has got, let us say, atomic knowledge. It, it doesn't make him damned, it doesn't make him a saint. It depends upon for what purpose we use. So that is an important point. Bhagavan here reinforces there is no such a division called secular or spiritual. Knowledge is knowledge. Saraswati is Saraswati, whether you want to become a doctor or in a, whatever, it is the mother. But if we can use that knowledge to worship God, to adore God, then it is absolutely fine. So, in the Bhagavad Gita, one more point is, yoga is both the goal and the path. Yoga, that is why it is Bhagavad Gita, Upanishads, Brahma Vityayam, Yoga Shastra. Yoga is both the means as well as the... So when you are beginning, it is the path. When you reached, it is the goal. That is why he is called Yogeshwara Yogeshwara. Yatra Yogeshwara Krishna Yatra Partho Dhanurdhara Tatra Sreer Vijayo Bhutir Dhruva Nitir Matir Mam. That is the last verse in the Bhagavad Gita. Grace and self-effort, they are obverse and reverse of the same coin. That is what just now I quoted. Where there is Krishna with yoga, where there is Arjuna who is to fight. Here yoga fight with the help of yoga. That is the idea. Krishna gives you the guidance. But who has to do the fighting? Arjuna. Where these two, self-effort and grace of God, are combined together, surely there will be victory, one attains to the highest goal. Finally, the according to Swami Vivekananda, there is one shloka which is the very essence of the Bhagavad Gita. Do you notice that? Klaipyam maasmagama partha naitatva yupapadhyate Klaibhyam Masmagama, do not become a eunuch. That means be a Brave. man, be a man. And that's what Sri Ramakrishna also said. Who is a man? He who is conscious of his man. And do you know what is man? Mana means he who is aware of his real nature. He is real man. He is a purusha. So, finally, the last point I wanted to say, worship God through one's own duty. Sri Krishna, in the Gita itself, clearly he says, any man can reach me by, he can worship by worshipping me. And how does a man or how should a man worship me? Through his own inherent duties, according to the station, according to the stage. Varna and Ashrama. And what does he mean by uh, Varna and Ashrama? These are peculiar terms which we will expound later on. These are the very essence of the Bhagavad Gita, special points of the Bhagavad Gita. Okay, now we will go to the what, what I call the Dhyana Shlokas. Now what I wanted to tell you, we are not studying Gita. Yes, we are studying Gita. But what is Gita? Gita is not a book. Gita is not a scripture. 
Gita is God himself. Gita is God himself. The six. What do they worship? Guru Granth Sahib. You know, they fan and they put flowers. Whatever we do to the uh, image or photo of God, they do everything to the book. And this idea is reinforced in the life of Sri Ramakrishna. That's why when I'm discussing Gita, I bring Thakur's life. And when I'm discussing Thakur's life, I bring also Gita Upanishads, etc. Do you remember that? Every evening, morning, Sri Ramakrishna used to clap his hands and chant Bhagavata, Bhakta, Bhagavan. Or one in three and three in one. Bhagavata means scripture. Bhagavatam means, doesn't mean Bhagavatam only. Okay. It could be Gita, it could be Bible, it could be Quran, anything. Why? It's a revelation from God. Revelation from God is God Himself. Revelation from God is God Himself. Okay. So, that the incident, <coughs> some of our devotees know, one evening, na- evening, Sri Ramakrishna was sitting in that particular temple at Dakshineshwar called Radha Krishna temple. And one pundit was expounding Bhagavatam. Suddenly Sri Ramakrishna had a vision. He saw a ray of light coming from the lotus feet of Bhagavan Krishna, touching the Bhagavatam and coming to the heart of Sri Ramakrishna and again going back to the feet of Bhagavan Krishna. So like a triangle. It came from the Lord and it touched the, the Bhagavatam and it touched the heart of the Thakur and went back. So from that day onwards, he, start, he added this also, Bhagavata, Bhakta and Bhagavan. Bhagavatam, Bhakta and Bhagavan. So what does it mean? Where there is a Bhagavatam, there is a devotee and there is God. Because Bhagavatam is nothing other than God himself. And who reads Bhagavatam? If somebody is reading Bhagavatam, he must be only a... Don't go on saying he could be a bookseller also. (laughs) Usually it is the devotee. Where there is a devotee, there is God. Can, Can there be devotee without God? Can there be God without devotee? Very important. If there is a God and there is no devotee, who recognizes him that he is God? (laughs) There must be a devotee to recognize that yes, yes, you are God, you are great, and I am worshipping you, and all that, then he says, yes, you are right. (laughs) Somebody has to certify, yes, you are God. Where there is God, there is Bhagavatam. Means what? Where there is an object, there is knowledge. What is Bhagavatam? Knowledge of God is called Bhagavatam. Scripture. We are not talking about a particular book called Bhagavatam. We are talking about Scripture. So, from that day, Sri Ramakrishna understood. Interesting point in this story, that ray of light did not touch the Pandit. (laughs) It touched Sri Ramakrishna. Because he was expounding it for the sake of, you know, it is his professional duty and he is doing it. But Sri Ramakrishna is a devotee. Means where there is Bhagavatam, there will be devotee and there will be Bhagavan. Where there is Bhagavan, there is devotee and scripture. And where there is devotee, there will be Bhagavatam. They are not three, but three sides of the same thing. That is what? If that is true, is it true in the case of Bhagavad Gita also? Yes, it is true in the case where there is Bhagavad Gita, there is God, there is devotee. So we have to consider it. That is why we have to salute. So there was a great soul called Madhusudana Saraswati and he had written most wonderful commentary on Bhagavad Gita. It's one of the most voluminous commentaries. Swami Gambhiranji Maharaj had translated it, if anybody wants to give. And he was supposed to have composed nine verses in praise of this Bhagavad Gita. These are called meditational slokas. 
very briefly i want to live what is meditation you want to think about sri ram krishna you want to adore sri ram krishna and then you have to meditate upon him you want to worship sri ram krishna you have to meditate upon him how do, how do you meditate so that meditation is called dhyana so to worship any god so he will be like this for example you know uh, if if we are worshiping sri ram krishna how do we worship हृदय कमल मध्ये राजित निर्विक सदसद किल भेदातीत प्रकृति विकृति शून्य निनंदमूर्ति विमल परमहंस रामकृष्ण भजा सो इफ यू वॉन्ट टू मेडिटेट अपन गणेश आर विष्णु शुक्लांबरधर विष्णु शशिवर्ण चतुर्भुज प्रसन्न वदन ध्यात सर्वघ्नोपशात इट इज एक्चुअली नाट नारायण ध्यान यू नो दैट is ganesha ganesha dhyana mantra yes but it, it comes like that what is the point point is to have a correct idea about that divinity upon whom we are want to focus our mind whom we would like to adore worship to think about we must have a proper idea that is what fulfills through these dhyana shlokas so in this dhyana shlokas there are what you call four salutations it is salutations and thinking the greatness of this bhagavad gita what are the four salutations saluting the mahabharata saluting the bhagavad gita saluting the lord krishna and saluting the teaching ultimately and describing why it has come how it has come etc four salutations are there So we will take out one by one. Om Parthaya Pratibodhitam Bhagavata Narayanena Swayam Vyasena Gradhitam Purana Munina Madhye Mahabharatam Advaitam Rita Varshinim Bhagavatim Astadashadhyayinim अंबत्वासंदी भगवदीते फस्ट ऐ विट दि ट्रांसलेशन दैन ऐ विस्प्लेन ए लिटल बिट ओम ओ मदर भगवदीता विथ विच अर्जुना पार्थ वॉज एनलाइटेड बै लॉर्ड नारायण हिमसेल विच वॉज कंपोज एंड प्लेस्ड इन दि मिडिल ऑफ दि महाभारत बै दि एनशियंट सेज व्यास which shavers the nectar of non duality which is glorious which contains 18 chapters and which is an antidote to the experience of change samsara i constantly meditate upon the slight explanation so this is uh, salutations to the bhagavad gita because bhagavad gita is another form of lord himself so it is parthaya pratibodhita to whom was this teaching given to partha arjuna partha is another name for arjuna pratibodhita arjuna pratibodhita addressing arjuna this teaching was given by whom bhagavata narayanena swayam by narayana himself through his incarnation as bhagwan krishna swayam so what does it mean why is it called bhagavat gita plus plus i explain gita means what song a song is very soothing song is very soothing so if you have something to complain sing a song <laughs> it will be tolerable by your husband <laughs> much more easily or the other way around also <laughs> yeah so that is why it is called as a song is soothing and it is easy also for us to take it in uh, instead of dry these things you know simple example i will give you so if you say hey uh, you must always worship god otherwise you will go to the very special place bhaj govindam bhaj govindam govindam bhaj moodhamate samprapte sannihite kale nahi nahi rakshate dukram karane if you sing that which is essence is same <laughs> but it is 
very nicely we take it. That's why it is called Bhagavad Gita, the song of the Lord. So, this Lord is addressing to Arjuna. What is important here, every sincere spiritual aspirant is Arjuna. And for him, who is, who is the Lord? Knowledge. So, what is the antidote for ignorance? Knowledge. So, knowledge is given. God himself, what does God give us? When God gives us, what does God give? Okay, when an ignorant person gives an advice to another ignorant person, <laughs> what do you think he will give? Still more ignorance. Yeah, andhe naiva niyamana yathantha. A one blind man leading the other blind people. So only knowledge can give to knowledge. That means God is of the nature of knowledge. So what is Bhagavad Gita? Knowledge. What is Bhagavad Gita? Bhagavan. So if he is Bhagavan, he is giving, he is of the nature of knowledge, so he is passing on that knowledge to dispel the darkness of ignorance from Arjuna's mind. So where do who has recorded it? Vyasena. Grathita. So, Vyasa is not the author. Vyasa is only the recorder like M is the recorder of the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. He is not the author. He is only compiler. That's why we call him our, our Veda Vyasa. Yes, our Veda Vyasa. So, who is this Veda Vyasa? Purana Muni. Purana Muni means, Purana means, two meanings are there. Purana Muni means one who has composed a lot of Puranas. He is supposed to be the author of 18 Puranas. But the other meaning of Purana is that he is a very ancient. That means he knows a lot. He has a lot of knowledge. So a man called Vyasa, in fact the very word Vyasa is not the name of a person. It is a title of a person. Vyasa means editor, compiler. So, because he compiled Vedas, so he got the name Veda Vyasa. Editor of, his, his real name was Krishna Dvaipayana. Krishna means, not this Krishna, dark. Krishna means dark. Draupadi was called Krishna. Krishna was also called Krishna. Vyasa was also called Krishna, dark. And he was born in an island. And his name, his father's name was Parashara. That's why he is called Parasharya, which will come here. Purana Munina. Where did he record it? Madhye Mahabharata. In the middle of Mahabharata. Where exactly do you know? There is a parva, a chapter called Bhishma Parva. Bhishma Parva, 25th chapter to 42nd chapter comes this Bhagavad Gita episode. And it came... Ten days after the war had started. I don't know, probably most of you are under the idea that before the war started, this Bhagavad Gita, it was given, it was recorded when? Ten days later. Why? This, was, this power was given by Vyasa to Sanjaya and Sanjaya was narrating this at Hastinapura ten days afterwards. Ten days passed, then Dhritarashtra was asking, Oh Sanjaya, how, how was it going on, having gathered, what happened, etc. Okay. So, what does this Bhagavad Gita, it is called Gita. So, he says, Advaita Amrita Varshinim. She rains down. She gives rain. What is the rain? Varsha means rain. Varshinim. What is that? Nectar. Amrita. Amrita means that which makes a mortal, immortal, is called Amrita. And what type of Amrita? Advaita. Advaita means what? You are divine. Whatever way you interpret, you are divine. You are not non-divine. You are divine. And it consists of how many chapters? This Bhagavad Gita. 80. That's why it says, Bhagavatim Astadasha Adhyayanim consisting of 18 chapters Amba 
she is not only amrutu bhagavati who is bhagavati bhagavan another side of bhagavan is called bhagavati, bhagavati. she is divine amba amba means oh mother twam anusandatam i meditate upon you like gayatri bhagavad gita oh mother bhagavad gita sambodhana bhagavad gita means o oh, bhagavad gita amba o oh, mother o oh, bhagavati you who consist of 18 chapters i meditate upon you and what do i get out of it bhava dveshini that means you destroy the ignorance of samsara bhava means samsara bhava sagara tarana karana he have you heard somewhere <laughs> Bhava, it means this world is called Bhava. Bhava means becoming, the world of becoming, Bhava. From the root word Bhu, it comes Bhava. Bhava means this world, worldly life. So, you destroy if anybody who listens to your teachings and follows them. Then, salutations to Vyasa himself. because he has taken the trouble mm. to record it namo stute vyasa vishala buddhe phullara bindaya tapatra netra enatvaya bharata taila purna prajvalito gnana maya pradipa salutations unto the o vyasa whose intellect is vast whose eyes are as large as the petals of a full blown lotus by whom was lighted the lamp of wisdom and the full essence of the mahabharata namostute vyasa vishala buddhe vishala buddhe means of deep knowledge what is deep knowledge knowledge according to scripture is of two types secular knowledge and spiritual knowledge here we are referring to what spiritual, spiritual knowledge so what kind of person is ಹುಲ್ಲ ಅರವಿಂದಾಯತ ಪತ್ರ ಯುವರ್ ಐಸ್ ಆರ್ ಲೈಕ್ ರಿಸೆಂಬಲ್ ಲೈಕ್ ದಿ ಬರ್ಡ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಎ ಲೋಟಸ್ ಲೀಫ್ ಬ್ಯೂಟಿಫುಲ್ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ವಿವೇಕಾನಂದ ಸೈಸ್ ಕಂಪೇರ್ಡ್ ಟು ಹಾಫ್ ಕ್ಲೋಸ್ಡ್ ಲೋಟಸ್ ಬರ್ಡ್ ಇಸ್ ಮೋಸ್ಟ್ ಬ್ಯೂಟಿಫುಲ್ ಐಸ್ ದೇರ್ ವಾಸ್ ಎ ಡಿವೋಟಿ ಎ ಡಿಸೈಪಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ವಿವೇಕಾನಂದ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಲೆಟರ್ ಆನ್ ಹಿ ವಾಸ್ ಆಸ್ಕ್ಡ್ ದ ಸ್ಟೋರಿ ವಿಲ್ ಕಮ್ ಲೆಟರ್ ಆನ್ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ಗಿವಿಂಗ್ ಎನ್ ಬ್ರೀಫ್ but what made you follow swami vivekananda was he teaching he said nothing doing i fell in love with his devilish eyes once i looked at them finished i i was hypnotized by them after that i gave up people do you know whom i was talking about sadan swami sadar later on sadananda yes he was a railway officer etc okay we will not go into it now so salutations what type of is a most beautiful eyes and there is also a beautiful meaning here who has beautiful eyes a person whose eyes are full of love full of and who whose eyes are full of love whose eyes could be full of love only a person who has knowledge so you see a mother's eyes are full of love why are they full of love towards her baby why this is my baby so his eyes are full of knowledge what is the knowledge everything is divine that is the knowledge and that's what he wanted to encapsulate through through the mahabharata through the bhagavatam as well as through the 18 puranas beautifully so ena tvaya bharata taila purna prajvalito nan you lit a lamp vyasa what is your greatness you lit a lamp what type of lamp is gnana maya ka it is a lamp of knowledge. knowledge and what is the oil see a lamp requires oil what is the oil here bharata taila purna mahabharatam is the oil that means what the very essence of the mahabharata is nothing but bhagavad gita that's what he wants the whole mahabharata is nothing but it is full of knowledge both 
knowledge about our life, knowledge also about our goal and how to achieve the goal. So, it is also believed this Bhagavad Gita is an aphorism and the whole Mahabharata and it consists of how many parvas? 18. It consists of 18. So, it is exposition of the Bhagavad Gita. That's what it is called. Okay. Then we move on. So, salutations to Vyasa. Then salutations to Bhagavan Krishna. Prapanna parijataya totra vetraika panaye gnana mudraya krishnaya gehitam rita duhe namaha. Salutations to Krishna who holds a cane in one hand and a gnana mudra. This is called gnana mudra and I explain to you. If you remember, Nana Mutra, who is the tree of fulfillment to all those who surrender unto him, who has milked the nectar of Gita. So, his, uh, the next verse it will give you, you know, all the Upanishads are cows, who is the milker? Bhagavan Krishna. So, that's what he is referring to. This whole Bhagavad Gita is nothing but milk. So, why is it called milk? So, it doesn't matter. You don't need to get all the cows. Let somebody tend the cows. All that you are uh, worried about is what? Only milk. It doesn't matter. Most people, you know, uh, they mix a lot of water. 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 It is necessary because for a child, watery milk is very good. So, it, that is what most of us are given until we grow, then we are given the real milk which we can really digest. So here is a person who is a prapanna parijata. Prapanna means one who takes refuge. For him, he becomes a kalpa vriksha, a wish fulfilling tree. Whatever the devotee wants, he will give. And how many desires people can have? Only four. Only four. What are they? Dharma, Artha, Karma and Moksha. God is ready to give. But the condition is, you must surrender yourself to the God. Prapanna. That is why Ramanuja's path is called Prapanna Marga. Prapanna Marga means path. Prapanna Marga means the path of surrender, self-surrender. So, Krishna, salutations to Krishna, who is the milker of this Gita, and he has already always is having this Jnana Mudra, his posture, and he has got a handle of a whip. We will we'll come to that very shortly. And he is like a wish fulfilling tree, but condition is uh, any person he must surrender himself to him. So, Prapanna Parijata to Krishna, who is like a wish fulfilling tree. For those who take refuge in him, Totra Vetraika Panaya. Totra Vetra means, Totra means whip. Vetra means handle. You know, if you have a whip, and how do you hold the whip? There must be a handle. And here, where was he sitting? On the chariot of Arjuna. Why? Because he has to control the horses. That is why he is also called Rishi Keshaha. Lord of the Indriyas. So, unless God sits in us in the form of knowledge and controls our body and mind, we are not going anywhere. That is the idea. So, to that Krishna, who holds the truth? And if the horses are going wrong, what does he do? Whip lash will come. <laughs> that is what is called. Whenever we are undergoing a sorrow or grief, it is the Lord in the form of dharma. He is whipping us. The purpose is, that's not the way to go. That's the wrong way. You have to go to the right way. And jnana mudraya. Always jnana mudra. So, did you get this explanation? This is called chin mudra, jnana mudra. Very briefly, today I will tell you. This is called paramatma. This is called jivatma. At this moment, jivatma is with is Stola Sharira, Sukshma Sharira, Karan Sharira. But when knowledge comes, he realizes I am God. Then he becomes one. And this becomes separate or assistant. So this is why it is called 
Chin Mudra, Man Mudra, one who is always automatically, he is showing this. Such a Krishna, who is the milker, that means who is the essence of all the scriptures, salutations to that Krishna. Now, just only one sentence I want to add to this. That is, Bhagavan Krishna contains the milk. Milk of nectar. Nectar of means what? Knowledge. Knowledge. So if one takes refuge in him, he doesn't need all the scriptures because he has done the work of squeezing the essence of the scriptures for us. He is holding the milk. After all, what do you want? Do you want a cow or do you want the milk? <laughs> we want the milk. So if anyone takes refuge in him, he will give that milk and he becomes blessed. So there are other six are there. We will take up in our next class. But it's very wonderful to have these Jnana Shlokas because this will give us an idea, first of all, what we are going to study. Secondly, it gives us faith in the scripture, in God. They are not ordinary words of ordinary persons. Words, ordinary words, they are, it is essence of nectar and which will free us from this samsara, bandhana, etc. And we have to salute them. That's why whenever you read Kathamrita or Gospel, you have to also salute M because it is through him that it has come. So with this, we will close today's, we will chant. Om Vasudeva Sutam Devam Kamsa Chanura Mardhanam Devaki Paramanandam Krishnam Mandi Jagat Guru